Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Don't worry, I'm not here to take you on some pretentious yoga or meditation journey. I'm asking you to simply be aware of the most fundamental basic requirement of life, breathing. Take a deep breath, everyone. As you do this, please be aware of those around you, sitting in front of you, behind you, to your left, to your right, anyone that's coughing. I actually have a cough right now myself, and I'm just back from South Africa. But when you're breathing around people and you're having someone coughing or sneezing around you, should you be aware? Should you be alarmed? To be perfectly honest, here in the northwest of England, in central Liverpool, in this lovely museum, probably not. The worst you're probably going to catch is the common cold. However, in some parts of the world, this is not the case, and you really should be aware, such as South Africa, where I have just come from, as people around you might actually be contagious. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to talk to you about the airborne human disease known as tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a long rod-shaped bacteria which is very resilient to many chemicals, compounds and drugs. It looks nothing like this, but uh, we do work with genetically modified strains, so they fluoresce so we can visualise them. The bacteria, is, the disease is caused by the bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it's still the predominant killers of human beings from a single infectious ages. And it's an intracellular bacteria as well. The World Health Organization currently estimates that a quarter of the entire globe is latently infected with this disease, which means we are carriers. One in four people are carriers around the world. So in this room, I've been told there's around 150 people approximately, which means 35 to 40 of us would be carriers based on this statistic, which is pretty alarming. The disease still predominantly affects the poorest people of the poorest parts of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, India and Bangladesh, as shown on their most recent map. We do have tuberculosis here in Europe, though, and in the United Kingdom. There's pockets of the disease in our big cities, such as London and Birmingham. And I'm sure many of you will be sporting your BCG vaccine on your left arm, which I had as a teenager, and I know many others did, but it has actually been recently stopped by the NHS and now has to be given to babies in certain parts of the country. As I say, the disease is massively widespread. It is estimated that 1.5 million people die every single year from this disease, and that equates to about 125,000 people every month, about 28,000 people every single week, and 4,000 people every single day. And as I said, it is the number one killer of human beings from a single infectious agent, which is pretty alarming. So my, here, my work here in Liverpool at the School of Tropical Medicine and as part of my PhD, which I did in Edinburgh, was looking at tuberculosis inside its natural environment, which is inside our immune cells. As shown in this image, the big blue circles you can see are macrophage cells. And these are basically big specialised cells which go around our body, gobbling up pathogens and bacteria and destroying them to, make us feel, to keep us well, basically, to kill anything that might make us poorly. You can see the red inside the cells, this is tuberculosis. So we're working with a genetically modified strain of tuberculosis which fluoresces. We have a green one and we have a red one, which is in this image. Working with tuberculosis, however, has some problems associated with it. It is a very dangerous biohazard, which means, as you know, it's airborne, so it's quite easy to contract. And working in the laboratory means we need specialised facilities and a lot of protective clothing so we don't actually contract the disease. This is myself working in Cape Town last year where I was based for a couple of months. Not only did we work with tuberculosis in the lab, but a huge amount of the staff I was working with had had tuberculosis at some point in, in, as part of their career, which was quite worrying. Now, as I said, when you're sitting next to someone and they're coughing and sneezing, just imagine all those millions of spittle coming out of their mouth into your airspace, which you are then breathing in. Next person that sneezes, you know, try and keep it in. So as this spittle is released, the bacteria is inside the spittle these little rods, and you then, unwillingly, breathe these in, enters into your lungs and into your airways, and this is the primary stage of infection. However, our body sends forth the first line of defence, the alveolar macrophage, these guys up on the screen. And what happens during an infection, as I say, it enters our lungs into the airways, and these cells go around and they gobble up our bacteria. Inside the cell it goes. And usually through phagocytosis, bacteria is destroyed in this environment as it acidifies a compartment which kills most bacteria. But very interestingly, what scientists have discovered is that tuberculosis can be found living inside these cells for many days, weeks, months, years, or even decades after an initial infection. Why? 
We don't really understand why, but we do know that it basically prevents the acidification inside the compartment in the cell. And it kind of goes to sleep inside these cells and can live there quite happily. And these are people who are latently infected until active signs of the disease come through, which is coughing and sneezing and a fever and quite quickly uh, weight loss. We have many drugs that we use for treating tuberculosis, and the primary one is known as rifampicin, which is a bright red color drug. As part of my PhD and the work at LSTM, as I say, we're looking at the tuberculosis inside our macrophage cells, as this is the important part for us. Because if we treat tuberculosis on its own with the drug, we can kill it very easily. But once it's inside our macrophage cells, the dynamics of the bacteria changes so dramatically, so it starts growing much more slowly. Its metabolism slows down and actually becomes quite resilient to everything. So during a normal infection, if we have our, as in the picture, we have our tuberculosis inside our macrophage cells, when we treat with the drug, what you can see is a huge amount of the drug goes to waste. Only a small amount is actually getting inside our macrophage cells to where we want it to be, to our bacteria. So during my PhD, we developed something known as the solid drug nanoparticles. These are just solid entities of drugs. So rifampicin as a solid drug nanoparticle compared to an aqueous formulation, essentially they're identical, they're just created differently. And what we found is that when we presented this drug in this formulation to our infected macrophage cell, the macrophage cell saw it as a baddie and tried to eat it. It gobbled it up and tried to phagocytose it. So then what we had, essentially, was direct drug targeting. We had drug and bug together inside a macrophage cell. And basically, we were getting more bang for our buck because when we compared the two formulations of drugs, exactly the same drug, exactly the same concentration of drug, we found this one to be 50-fold more effective at killing mycobacteria, which is pretty exciting stuff. The minimum treatment requirement for tuberculosis is six months, and this is a multi-drugs every single day for a six-month period. And if you have, have multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis or extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, this can go up to two years. And many of the patients I have met have told me that the actual disease is better than the treatment itself because there's side effects associated with these drugs. So if some of the work we're doing could potentially lessen the treatment period down from six months, say to three or four, or to, le to lessen the amount of drugs we have to give patients, this would be a massive feat in itself. So next time you are queuing in Tesco for your weekly shop, or you're in your GP surgery, or you're going to your yoga meditation class, be aware of everyone around you, coughing and sneezing and spitting into your airspace that you're breathing with them. Think of all those little microbes entering into your lungs. And think for a second of our little friends, the macrophages and millions of other immune cells, which go around to protect us, gobbling up and killing these bacteria. But also think of tuberculosis, which has, in many cases, evaded this surveillance of our immunity. And think of the millions and millions of people around the world who are treating, being treated with tuberculosis right now. This year alone, we had 10 million new people who became infected. And as I say, 1.5 million people died. And also, there's complications if you've got diabetes or HIV, for example, which makes treatment of the disease even more complicated. So ladies and gentlemen, TB or not TB, that is congestion. But the question is whether research that we're doing here in Liverpool and other institutes around Europe could potentially reduce the treatment period and make things much better for millions of people around the world. Thank you.